Okay, thank you. So uh, before I start, I wanted to point out one small um, notation inconsistency between my lectures and Sasha Kuznetsov's lectures. So in my lectures, so when S is a subject, is a subset of the objects of a triangulated category, and I use these angle brackets, I mean the smallest extension close subcategory containing that set, right? The extension closer, where extension means if the, uh, I mean, if the first and the third of an exact triangle are in your uh, subcategory, then the middle one should also be. Whereas in Sasha Kuznetsov's lecture, it meant the smallest triangulated subcategory containing these. Right, so, I mean, a another thing you, m yeah, oh, let me leave it at that. Okay, so what I'll do today is um, um, st st explain for you the construction of stability condition on surfaces and then go towards um, applications. And so let me start with a little bit of preparation. So I'll, X will be a smooth projective surface. Over K and the characteristic of K will have to be zero. And actually that, that, that's really crucial. So I do not know whether stability condition exists on an arbitrary surface in characteristic P. In fact, I wouldn't be surprised if they don't exist in, in general. Um, and then H is a polarization. Right, so the, a class of an, say class of an ample line bundle. And um, as my as my v l and lambda l fix the following, so I mm, so so I mean uh, so I go from the k group into R three by sending e to the vector rank of e h dot churn one and churn two, right, and lambda isomorphic to z cubed will be the image of we. Um, and then claim, my claim is that there does not exist a stability condition sigma equal z comma a in stop lambda of x with where you where you start with coherent sheaves. Right, and I, I I'll I mean I I won't I won't prove this, but you might want to try it as an exercise yourself if you want. And this even holds more generally if instead of just this rank three lattice, I would have chosen here the, the image of the churn character. So by taking lambda, essentially the, the algebraic cohomology. Right, so I cannot just use for coherent sheaves, there is my claim that there is no central charge function that has, has this um, upper half plane property. Right, and so instead, And by the way, if you want to find a proof, it's in one of your Kinobo's papers. I forgot which one. But, um, so instead, what I'll start with, I'll start with guessing, right? So instead of guessing the heart, I, I'll start guessing the the, the central charge function. Right, and so will depend on two parameters, but let me start introducing them slowly, right? So, I mean, what we did for curve, somehow we did degree in this direction and rank in this direction. And so this is for curves. And I mean, for surfaces, now we have three degrees. We have the rank, we have the degree of C1, and we have the degree of churn two. And some of the natural extension seems to be to go like this. Rank h dot churn one and churn two. 
right? But um, now it also is about time to allow for some parameters, right? I mean, here, if we use the parameter in front of the rank, we could just undo that choice of the parameter by using the TL2 action. But certainly with these three rays, we couldn't do that anymore. And so this parameter will be a, um, the choice of a um, positive real number alpha. Right, which is basically, I mean, of course, this imagine part rescaling doesn't do too much. It's really just rescaling the contribution of the rank compared to the, the um, contribution of churn two. And let me also introduce uh, another twist here um, by twisting the churn character by some real number, where here churn beta of E is e to the minus beta h churn zero of e, h uh, churn of e. Right, so for better integral, this just means you're, you're tensoring your whole construction by a multiple of h, but you can numerically interpolate between these integral values. Okay, and um, now note that for, for alpha going to plus infinity, some of this, if you look at these terms, of course, that's dominated by churn zero and churn one. So in other words, this is asymptotically the phase of the alpha beta is just asymptotically um, governed by, by the ordinary slope. So let me do, define this precisely definition for a coherent sheaf. I define mu h, and let me also twist this by beta for convenience, although here it doesn't, doesn't really make a big difference. It's just shifting everything by a real constant. So here I take the slope h dot churn one beta of e divided by the rank of e. If that is positive, and plus infinity otherwise. And you should, you should think of this as um, given by something like a central charge, namely by z bar equal minus um, minus h on one beta of E plus H squared over two churn zero of E. And let me also introduce the, uh, these factors, alpha squared and alpha here, or even though, I mean, here, of course, this doesn't make a difference up to the GL2 action, but just to make the Z bar close, more closely related to Z alpha beta, I basically have just forgotten the churn two term and then um, rotated everything by 90 degrees. Right, so basically, the, the phase of this complex number is in directly related to, to the slope over here. And then the definition is that E in coherent sheaf is slope semi-stable if for all A into E onto B, we have, um, and here there's a kind of slick way to um, find stability here by comparing not the slope of A with E, but the slope of A with B. So I, actually I learned this from, uh, from Yukinovo. Right, some of the point is that um, because of things that have um, churn zero and churn one equal to zero, the Caesar property is no longer as strict. It could be that I have equality here and inequality here for the slopes, right? This could be equal and this could be strictly um, less than. Anyway, and um, right, so this is just ordinary slope stability. 
And so the first fact about this slope stability is that Hadron Zimmern filtrations exists for E in co, co x. And um, this notion of slope stability. Right, and, and the proof is, is exactly the same as the one I gave. Um, I gave on Monday for slope stability on curves. And the other fact, and this will be really crucial, is um, the Bogomolov-Giesecke inequality. So it says the following, if, if E in coherent sheaf is torsion free, and slope stable, or slope semi-stable. Then we have the following quadratic inequality. So then, um, turn one of E squared minus um, two turn zero of E turn two of E is greater or equal to zero. So we do have a quadratic inequality for the churn classes of semi-stable objects, just as what we want for, um, for the support property. And as a corollary, I mean, if E in E and G of X is slope stable, and now slope semi-stable, and now here I'm allowing it to be a torsion sheaf, then the following expression um, delta H of E is greater or equal to zero, where delta H is now given by H dot turn one, where at minus two, H squared turn zero, turn two. Here? Yeah. Yeah, so, so it actually doesn't matter. This expression is invariant under changing beta. Uh, yeah, yeah, this one here, here it's, it's just for convenience, right? It's just changing everything's by constant. Yeah. But, but, but I mean, the, the, the more interesting thing is, right, this really depends on the polarization, but this inequality does not. Right, but I mean, somehow I'm, I'm dropping this now, I'm really, I'm changing this now into an inequality that depends on H. Right, and, 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 and the, the point here is just, um, by the Hodge index theorem, you have that um, h squared shown one squared is always less than or equal to h dot shown one squared. Okay. Um, and I mean, and the, and then it, it's also obviously true for torsion sheets, right? If if the rank is zero, then this is obviously greater or equal to zero. Okay, any, any more questions so far? Okay, now we are um, basically ready for the right for the actual construction. I mean, note that um, the alpha beta, so maybe I should also use some z alpha beta here. This is equal to uh, minus turn two beta plus um, minus i times z bar alpha beta. Right, so um, these are really closely related. And, um, Right, so, so you should think of this central charge as being obtained from just first rotating this one and then adding this turn to beta term. Well, this is good news, right? Because we know what to do with um, rotating the central charge. We just, um, we just tilt the corresponding heart of the teach structure. That's, that's the, just the, this GO2 action, right? And so this leads to the following definitions. 
Um, maybe let me go over here. Right, so T, T beta. Maybe let me write this. And um, these are just all the T data mu H beta stable. with um, positive slope, and then I take the extension closure, and then F beta to be the same thing. All right, so exactly this torsion pair that I associated to any stability condition and the cutoff phase. And then I let uh, co beta to be the, um, to be the tilt of coherent sheaves at this torsion pair. Right, and so I can either think of this as T beta, F beta shifted by one, and then taking extension closures, or I also gave you this, con um, this description in terms of two-term complexes. Right, so our H minus one has to be in F, and H0 has to be in, in, um, in T beta. Right, and, and, and basically, the, as for stability condition on surfaces, the entire magic of the derived category that we're going to use is just that this is an abelian category, right? What I, the heart of a bounded T structure, and so it's an abelian category. And almost everything we'll be doing We'll just be doing slope stability in this, this abelian category. Right, and so let me, let me just draw, draw the corresponding picture here, right? So what I, this rotating by minus i corresponds, but by right, this rotating by minus i means that coherent sheaves are now over here, right, and what I, what's above this line here, um, that's T beta, um, T, be, yeah, T beta, what's below this line is F beta, and so we are replacing this by F beta shifted by one, and then in the upper half plane we have the, um, We have co beta of x. Right, and, and you've also seen how to do, now we are just changing the center charge by a real parameter, right? And you've also seen how to do that in, the, in my lecture yesterday when I, um, when I was deforming um, bridge sensibility conditions. Right, and it, it turns out that almost the same, right, um, right, and so, I mean, if I just take this um, minus i z beta alpha beta co beta of x, then this is a this is still a, a weak stability condition. Right, by, by, by which I mean if you do, right, I mean here we saw f how to go from this kind of weak central charge, I mean, um, sorry, maybe let me be precise here, right, this, what, what I mean by, um, this is that this is a weak central charge in the sense that the image is contained in um, the upper half plane union the negative real line union zero. Right. Minus i c alpha beta bar of co beta x. Um, this is contained in the semi closed upper half plane, but no. 
um, zero added. And what I mean by weak stability condition is basically just pretend that objects with um, central charge equal to zero have maximal phase. Right, and so pretend that if E is in so beta of X and um, C minus I C bar of E equal to zero, then the phase of that is just being equal to, at, um, equal to one. Right, and, and by the way, what, is, what does this mean? This means that um, this condition is equivalent to E being a zero-dimensional torsion sheath. Okay, and, and moreover, it, it, it also satisfies something like the property, right? It weakly satisfies the Support property in the sense that, right, so we have this quadratic form that's greater or equal on semi stables. And now, why, why do I say weakly? Because if you look at the kernel um, yeah, kernel of Z bar, then that's actually equal to zero. Right, so I, I, I would want, in the support property, I had that this is negative definite, and now here it turns out that the kernel is directly contained in a negative code, right? Because it's just these uh, vectors zero, zero, one. Yes? H is still this polarization. Right, and delta H is this, this form over here. Okay, and then, I mean, what I claim is that you can adapt the arguments from paragraph three to this situation. To show that, um, Um, right, and so I mean, maybe let me attribute this just due to Bridgeland for K3 surface and to Akara Bertram, potentially for arbitrary surfaces, is that um, co beta x C alpha beta, and maybe, le maybe let me add Yukinobo for the last statement here, that co co beta x C alpha beta. Um, is a stability condition satisfying the support property with respect to the quadratic form delta H. Right, so this is an actual bridge and stability condition, and we still have this quadratic inequality for um, churn classes of semi-stable objects that we had for, for slope-stable sheets. Okay, any, any questions so far? Um, so you just look, I mean, you, you take a curve on your surface, and then you look at um, line bundles on this curve, right? So the, um, um, they, differ, they, they all differ just by churn two, and they all have to be in the upper half plane, right? So this shows that the churn two has to be a real contribution. And so all the line bundles are somehow on the same height, right? And so, I mean, let me let me, I could take C, let's say in H, 
first you look at OC of nx, the center charge of these would all have to be on the same height because they just differ by, by some, each of them differ by um, z of the skyscraper sheaf of a point and the only way this can happen is if they're all horizontal. But then if you look at z of um, O of nh, right now this depends quadratically on the, I mean, of course you can write this as a sum of z of O plus contributions from there plus um, things from here. And then the, the I mean, it, the imaginary part of that is, um, uh, is just negative for n going to minus infinity. Okay, so maybe let me start drawing some picture, right? So in lambda r is isomorphic to r cubed, and delta h is a um, quadratic form of signature two comma one, right? So I have this um, this cone like this, where the interior of the cone is the part with delta h less than zero, and the outer part is where delta h is greater or equal to zero, and you may wonder where this, um, I mean, here, here's another justification for where these strange, maybe slightly strange looking formulas for Z alpha beta come from. Well, it's just that if you take the map from R greater than zero cross R to the um, projectivization of the negative cone, right, so this is the upper half plane and this is the Poincaré disk. They are, of course, um, naturally isomorphic. And here I have this map alpha beta goes to kernel of Z alpha beta. And that's just a standard identification of the upper half plane with the Poincaré disk. So this is an, this is an isomorphism. And in particular, I mean, my, my formula is here for kernel Z alpha beta. This really precisely describes the entire component given by, given by the, uh, promised by the quadratic form, right? I mean, yesterday I told you for any central charge that's um, where the kernel is negative definite with respect to delta H, I can uh, get the stability condition just by deformation and it turns out that they're all up to the GL2 R action um, given by Z alpha beta and co beta. So he, he, here's another thing to note. So skyscraper receives OX. These are, are stable in, in, with respect to sigma alpha beta, maybe. Let me write this. Right, just, just because, I mean, they are in co beta x of maximal phase, and so that, that, that's very easy to check. And, I mean, conversely, can show that geometric stability condition by which I just mean that skyscraper sheaves are stable of the same phase. Our up to the GL2 R action essentially obtained from these formulas are essentially of this form.
And le let me say what essentially means, right? So, so let me again write down the formula for C alpha beta. I mean, somehow the, the, the fact that here I was using alpha squared over 2 and here um, turned to beta, this exactly comes from the fact that um, directly comes from bogomolov giesecker inequality. And basically, whenever I'm on a surface where I have a stronger inequality than bogomolov giesecker inequality, then I have more freedom with these parameters. Right? So, um, a stronger, if my surface admits a stronger bogomolov giesecker inequality, then I have more freedom with the, with the parameters. Or of the central charge. And in particular, I mean, solving the problem which central charges precisely are allowed for geometric stability condition is basically equivalent to proving sharp bounds for bogomolov giesecker type bounds for um, churn classes of slope-stable vector bundles. Okay, any, any more questions at this point? Well, well, I mean, what I mean is that, I, that I'm not, uh, so I don't mean two varying alpha and beta more, but say, um, um, you know, say using a bigger number than one here, for example. Like that. Uh, wait, what do I mean? Yeah, or I mean, re, re, so for example, replacing this here by minus turn to beta plus some constant times the rank, something like this. Okay, so then I should say a bit about. Um, Wall crossing. And I'll first say some things in the abstract and then make this more concrete for surfaces and, and, and use it in examples. Right, and so let's say I fix V in lambda and let's say for simplicity that it's primitive. And then for For, um, for sigma in star lambda of x, let me look at the m sigma of v, which is the set, or of course, you could hope that it's a stack or an algebraic space, maybe a moduli space, cross moduli space of um, sigma stable objects E and D with V of E equal to V of E equal to V. And now I can I can now I vary sigma. And what does wall crossing mean? Wall crossing means that this behavior is controlled by a by a set of walls. So 
proposition that there is a the locally finite set of walls, by which I mean real typically typically co dimension one um, sub manifolds. Um, so that if I let um, a locally function, if I let chambers to be the um, components of the of the of the complement, then the following holds. So let me first draw a picture. Uh, in 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 um, in the space of stability with this. Um, right, so, but as I said, typically there are co-dimension one submanifolds, or I could also have some theoretical. I could also have, sometimes I could also have phenomena like this, like an isolated co-dimension two point or wall set stop. So that. Um, so first of all, M sigma of V is unchanged as sigma varies in a chamber. And sorry, here I should have should have insisted on semi-stable objects. And secondly, that um, sigma of V contains strictly semi-stable objects. Objects if and only if um, sigma is in the wall. Right, so in other words, there's nothing happening as long as Sigma varies within the chamber, but then once we cross a wall, the model, there are some strictly semi stable objects on the wall, and the modelized space or, um, will be different on the other side of the wall. So it will parameterize different objects on the other side of the wall. Right, and so, I mean, let me sketch a proof. If E is strictly semi stable, Right, and it has a jordan hölder filtration. And let's say um, EI are the jordan hölder factors. The, filtra the stable filtration quotients. Then um, Right, and the, the picture must look something like this. Here we have Z of E, and all the Z of E I's are somehow on the same ray, but of strictly smaller, strictly smaller absolute value. Right, so you have Z of E I are less than Z of E, which is the same as Z of V. But you also have that, um, um, I mean, in my notation from yesterday, by the support property, you have the norm of P of EI is less than or equal to norm of C of EI, less than C of V. Right, and so this shows that there are there are only finitely many such classes because I, 
right? Remember, as soon as I bound um, Z of the class and, and P of the class, then there are only finitely many candidates, right? So only finitely many possibilities, finitely many choices for um, V of VI, as long as um, V of V is bounded. So in other words, as, as, as long as I'm varying within a compact set, there are only finitely many such choices. And then locally, um, the wall, um, I mean, the wall associated to this strictly semi-stable objects is given by um, Z of E I um, parallel to Z of E for all I. And that defines a real co-dimension one sub-manifold. Uh, I mean, in typically it's a real co-dimension one sub-manifold if these, um, say if they're just two John Holder factors or if they're all contained in a rank two lattice of the of lambda. Right, and, and I mean, how does this look like in this picture? I mean, as I already indicated, I mean, I always like to think of the um, varying a stability condition in terms of varying the kernel of its central charge. Right, so here, um, how does a, right, if this is the kernel of, of Z, then how does this, this kind of condition look like on, on Z? Right, I mean, it's actually the same thing this condition is equivalent to saying that the that the kernel of Z is contained in the rank two lattice spanned by V of E I and V. Right, so in other words, so if somewhere here I have V, then this means that the kernel is con and here I have V of E I, then I have this rank two plane spanned by those. And the wall is exactly given by the set where the kernel is contained in this rank two lattice. So in other words, if I draw a cross section, and I'm all interested in the walls for my fixed class V, then they all look like line segments of lines going through, going through V. Right, and so in particular, for example, in the situation I've been in for surfaces with either Picard rank one or with um, fixing this rank three lattice lambda, then the, the walls can never intercept. Okay, and so, and the second thing I should say is about this wall crossing is that there's always this a Giesecker chamber. That's near the point that's sometimes also called large volume limit. Right, and it's actually um, I said I still have the central charge over here, right? So, so remember, for for alpha sufficiently large, the phase of this complex number is essentially determined by turn one. But then also, if I mean the somehow the slopes of two objects are the same, then somehow turn two acts as a tiebreaker, and that's exactly the same that happens for for um, Giesecker stability, right? And so, um, and and so this leads. To the, to the following proposition. Um, so if um, I again fix V in lambda, and let's say that um, beta 
such that mu h of beta of v is positive, right? In other words, that's the same as beta being smaller than the um, ordinary slope of, of v. Then um, for alpha um, sufficiently big, we have that this m sigma alpha beta of v, that's exactly the moduli space of Giesecker stable sheaves. A with um, V of E equal to V. Right, and, and maybe if you don't know Giesecker stability, just assume that the rank and the um, C1 of V are co-prime, and then it just means you're looking at uh, slope-stable sheaves of this class. Right, and so, so in particular, the, the set here is really, it's a, it's, a, uh, it's a projective variety that can be constructed via GIT. And, um, but, but, but I, I mean more than that, I, just, I don't just mean an identification of the spaces, I really mean that, um, so E with V of E, and so if you have E in co-beta, V of E equal to V, then E is sigma alpha beta semi-stable, if and only if E is a Giesecker stable sheaf. So I'm really precisely identifying the objects on both sides. Right, and so, so in other words, in this, in this picture over there, there's a, of all these chambers, there's a Giesecker chamber. So somewhere here there is zero, zero, one corresponds to alpha going to plus infinity. And somewhere here you have, maybe let's say here you have we. Then here there is possibly a wall where um, beta is equal to u h of we. Right, and then there's always a Giesecker chamber so that along this entire chamber, um, this, ident this identification holds. And maybe let me also say um, what happens here. So this here is Giesecker derived dual. So um, here m sigma alpha beta is parameterizing the derived duals of Giesecker stable G's. Right, so if you take a vector bundle, then the dual is. Sorry? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And it's um, a zero, zero, one. So, I mean, when alpha is going to infinity, then the, then the kernel is just given by then the kernel of the alpha beta is just given by um, vectors of the form zero, zero, one. Yeah. Right, and then there, are, there might be more, of course there might be more walls down here. Okay, and so in particular, I mean, it's, it's an interesting question to ask. You have this classical modular space of Giesecker stable sheaves and there's a wall crossing here, what's happening?
Okay, so what I'll do in the remaining time today and tomorrow is basically give a survey of applications. And um, I mean, I'll, I'll touch on a few different things. And so my, I mean, now my talk will be a little bit more um, uh, survey style. And the, the first thing I'll, I'll want to, to say is to relate to something that came up in Sasha Kusnetsov's lecture yesterday, namely relating um, Kiesecker stability um, with, um, with quiver GIT. Right, so I mean, um, Sasha explained this as an example, but it turns out that stability conditions also tell you um, quite systematically what choices you can make. Right. And so let's, let's say x is equal to p2. And then yesterday you saw that by, um, right, by Balenson's theorem, this is the derived category of p2 is isomorphic to the representations of this quiver with three vertices and three errors like this from the first to the second, from the second to the third, modular some relations. And maybe, maybe let me make this relation a, a little bit more precise. So right for the, um, for the, I mean, you're, of course, there are many such equivalences, essentially depending on the choice of your exception collections. Um, but they are, right here, there are always these um, simple objects as one, as two, and as three, by which I mean the simple representations are given by one-dimensional vector space at the corresponding vertex and zero everywhere here. And somehow for the standard exception collection, you can say precisely what they correspond to. They correspond to O of minus one shifted by two into omega one shifted by one and by O. Right, and for every other exception collection, you can, it's easy to work out what these objects are. They're always just given by the dual exception collection. So um, for example, right, you could replace these by any, um, for example, by tensoring all of them by the same line bundle, but you can also apply these mutations and so on. Right, and so we would, so, of course, people knew since the 80s that you can describe um, vector bundles on P2 using, I mean, even though they weren't saying it in this language at the time, maybe using representations of these quivers. But if, say, we want to know precisely which choices of exception collection and so, so which choices of derived equivalence like this would work for a given churn character and, um, and Giesecker stability, then the answer is that this is precisely described by, by bridge and stability, right? Namely, I mean, we have now seen, we have two ways to construct stability conditions. On DB of X, right? So first via this sigma alpha beta, so co beta, the alpha beta, right, just coming from this side as the derived category of coherent sheaves, but then also by what I did in my first lecture, um, via quiver representations. Of course, the natural condition is when do they coincide? And, um, and the, the simple lemma here is that um, if S1, S2, and S3 are sigma alpha beta stable, wait so that their phases are contained in an interval of length one.
for some phi in R. Then sigma alpha beta is isomorphic up to the GL2R axon. Um, up to to a, a, a quiver stability condition. Right, and I mean, let me, let me sketch the proof here. Right, so I mean, up to the, up to the GL2R axle, we may of course assume that S1, S2, and S3 um, have phases between zero and one. And what does this mean? This means that they're contained in the heart Associated to our associated to our stability condition, right? And so this means that now, if you take the extension closure, since this is an extension closed subcategory, the extension closure of these three vertices is contained in A. Okay, but what is this extension closure? Well, we are looking at a quiver without without cycles or loops. And so this means all representations can be written as extensions of the D simple representations. Right? So this is just isomorphic to my category of quiver representations. And in particular, this is this is, I mean, this is the heart of a bounded T structure, and this is also the heart of a bounded T structure. And I mean, if it's a general fact, if you have two bounded T structures and one heart is contained in the other, then they have to be the same. And then it just follows from the fact that the stability condition is uniquely determined by its heart and the central torch. Okay, and now, I mean, of course, um, how does this help you? Well, the point is that, um, I mean, these are all slope-stable sheaves. And so in particular, they are, they are stable at a large volume limit. But you can also actually say a lot more. You can, you can really compute explicitly where the first wall is. And I mean, without going into the details of this computation, the picture that you get is now the following. So here you have. What it turns out is that you can cover the entire um, boundary of this cone by regions that are that are described by quivery stability condition, right? So each such um, segment that I'm drawing here, this is the uh, Quiver stability conditions for a fixed quiver and a fixed exceptional collection. Why right? take? I mean, what I mean by this: start with the balance on quiver mutated in some way. You get this derived equivalence between dB of P2 and dB of some quiver, and then the region where this the, the assumptions of this lemma hold will be this given by this by a region like this. In particular, you can cover the entire boundary. And um, in fact, you can cover the entire boundary just by twists of the, of the standard exception collection. Right, and now let's look again at the picture we had, the wall crossing picture we had. So here we have we, and here we have somehow the first wall. And here you have the Giesecker chamber. 
right? And then what this lemma is saying, take any of the quivers occurring in this chamber and you'll, you'll get that mh of v is equal to this um, GIT moduli space of quiver representations. Right, and it, it precisely it tells you which choices you can make. Just take any, any choice so that this region of quivery stability condition intersects your, intersects your Giesecker chamber. Right, and so, um, right, so if you want to know exactly which exception collections you can use to describe one Giesecker moduli space, then the answer is just take any exception collection so that the associated quivery region intersects the Giesecker chamber of your given class. Right, so here, this would be the first one among all the set that are true that you could use, and then you can use all the ones coming up here. Right, and um, right, so you could use some up here, or you could use some down here. Yeah, exactly, right. So here from here you have lots of chambers, quivery chambers that are somehow connected by your mutations. And I mean, if one region is like this, then the next one might look like this, and like this, and like this. And I mean, the statement is you can easily show that you can cover the entire boundary. And so this, in particular, this means that any, I mean, any Giesecker chamber will intersect many of these regions. And so you have many possible choices for your exception collection so that um, your moduli space of Giesecker stable sheaves becomes just an ordinary moduli space of quiver representations in, in your corresponding quiver. Yeah, I mean, up, up, to this, up to this GL2 R twist, right? I mean, the, 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 the quivery heart will never be isomorphic to co-beta, but it will be isomorphic to a tilt of co-beta. Okay, and also note that, I mean, any wall crossing, any, right, so any, right, so I, I said that any MH of V is described by quiver representations, but really any M sigma alpha beta of V and any wall crossing can be described via G, quiver GIT. Okay, I'm, I'm out of time, so let me stop here for today. Thanks.